Turner College, and it is my pleasure to welcome you here this morning for our um, Executive Speaker Series. We have a treat for you today as we have the President and CEO of the Columbus Chamber of Commerce as the speaker. Uh, what better person to have than the person who is like one of the ultimate business leaders in the community, the President and CEO of the Columbus Chamber. Uh, Mr. Anderson is a native of South Carolina. He uh, went to undergraduate school at Francis Marion University. He has been living in Columbus since 2015, I believe, since 2015. And he has served time in the U.S. Army as a military intelligence officer, which we might have some questions about. And uh, has also served 18 years in the beverage industry, having worked for Coca-Cola and for Anheuser-Busch. Uh, in 2008, he became President and CEO of the Greater Dalton, Georgia Chamber of Commerce. And he has gone through the U.S. Chamber of Commerce's Institute of Organizational Management uh, in 2012. And he is a certified Georgia Chamber of Commerce executive. All right? um, he is currently the chair-elect of the board of Georgia Association of Chamber Executives. So he is not only a leader here in our community, but also throughout the state. He is on several boards. Uh, he has been appointed, he was appointed by former Governor Deal to the Georgia State Workforce Development Board. He is the Vice Chair of the Columbus Technical College Foundation Board of Trustees. And he's a member of the Muskogee Educational Excellence Foundation Board, and also a member of the Columbus Rotary Club. Uh, one of his uh, most uh, notorious claims to fame, however, is that he has been selected, since he has been in Columbus each year, as one of the most influential Georgians by the Georgia Trend magazine. So it is a real pleasure, a real treat for us to have uh, a true business leader in our midst, Brian Anderson. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning. We're good? Um, thank you, Dean. That was uh, way nicer than it uh, probably needed to be, and certainly longer. That the longer your bi your bio gets, that means you're older, and you're. Um, so if you have a one paragraph, be thankful. Cause that means you still have a lot of life ahead of you, versus um, the long one. And <clears throat> and I actually shortened that one to try to get it to where it was manageable. But I do appreciate the the recognition. I do have a phenomenal job, not because of the title, not because of. Um, and your recognition, but because I get to work for the betterment of the community. And it took me a very circuitous, circuitous path to get to this point. It took a lot of trial and error. I'm going to talk a, bit, a little bit about that. But my job simply is to try to make the lives of our citizens and really our state, not just Columbus and the region, but in the state, um, as good as they can be. That's to make sure there are opportunities for people to pursue their dreams. No different than your professors, your church uh, leaders, no different than your mom and dad or your friends is all of us are part of this ecosystem to try to make uh, life as we know it or the pursuit of life uh, the best it can be and I didn't always have that so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, really three things that and, and from a marketing standpoint I use the three P's purpose passion and people and we'll, and we'll talk about that as to what it means maybe at the point you are in your life and maybe where you may be going But before we get to that point uh, I've already registered my complaint with a couple but on on the record, Dean, for the video purposes, it's not fair to make me follow the mayor. For those that don't know the mayor, she's extremely bright and quite articulate. And so every time I go, and go to something, of course, by rank, she's first. And then it's typically somebody else and me. And every single time, nobody even knows I'm at the event, much less that I said anything. So from now on, if you invite me back, I want to be first. And then bring people like the mayor, Jason Cuevas, Mr. Alexander, bring these folks behind me so that uh, the bar gets set very high. Um, let me start with a couple of philosophical questions, because this, uh, if this is going to be impactful for not only uh, me and the purpose of why we're here, it should, I think it'll help you all as well. This needs to be a discussion. If this is just a lecture, then I'm not going to last very long. Um, why are you here? And this, again, this is the audience feedback portion. So why are you here? I'm going to leave it that broad for a minute. If I look at you really long, it means you've got to answer. Why are you here? Front rows all not looking down. Somebody. Why are you here, diplomats? 
Oh, put me on the spot. Mm -hmm. um, I am here because some uh, students came to my school in, at, while I was back at Parkview in Gwinnett County and introduced me to a couple of the professors here and they talked to me about the, per the computer science program. Yeah. And that's what brought me here initially. To see issue. Okay, let's pull the lens back a little bit more. Why are you here on this earth? We get real hard. Why do you exist? <coughs> Professors can chime in too. Sir? To make the world a little bit better than it was when you got here, and leave it off a little bit better. We could probably spend all day wordsmithing that answer and make it really fine, defined, but that's as good as I can come up with. We're not here just to take up space or to, take, uh, to use oxygen, but to do something for somebody else. And I think that gets lost in most every conversation we have had, and certainly what's happening at the national level right now. We get caught up in uh, the, 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 the microscopic issue or um, the emotion of certain things going on, and we lose fact that we're here because of each other. And that's going to be important today as well as we go through this. Um, anybody want to tell me, what are your plans after CSU? Who knows right now what you're going to do pretty quickly after you get that shingle? Nobody? Run my own business. All right. Hunt, run, your own, run your own business. Excellent. Um, run my husband's business and also be a financial advisor for the military. Mm -hmm. Kirk, professor, professor, we got a couple up here to get in the program. <laughs> Excellent. For most of you, I assume your hands didn't go up because you may not know today, and that's not just okay, that's probably um, appropriate. Uh, I knew about as far as getting my degree meant I also pinned on Lieutenant Bars to go into the Army, so I knew at least the next two to three to four years we're going to be doing this thing called the Army, but I really didn't know beyond that. I said, I'll try one path get some experience, have some fun, serve my country, and then we'll take it from there. I wasn't quite, I couldn't have articulated it at that point. But that's really what I, I did not say, I'll be a career military officer, or I'll do this 2.8 years, then I'll go into business. I knew, take the next chapter. And thankfully, that, that Army experience, which <clears throat> I'm going to try to keep uh, uh, intertwining the words people, passion, purpose, I didn't go in the army, army for the purpose of serving my country or the purpose of being the best second lieutenant or army intelligence officer. I went into the army for the purpose of it paid for my education. I paid the first two years and I was tired of being broke. A couple of attorney brothers of mine said, hey, the army's got money. Go through ROTC and you go wear this uniform and you might get to go in the army, but they'll pay your school. I went, check. So they paid for my school. I did go through ROTC. I got indoctrinated, went into the Army, and it was one of the best things I did for a couple reasons. Gave me valuable experience. When you walk into the Army, especially as a second lieutenant, you know absolutely nothing. You think you do, but you don't. And NCOs, non-commissioned officers and soldiers, teach you your job, typically the first six to eight months. You get some training, but you got to go make some mistakes. You got to go really cut your teeth on some problems, get told you screwed something up a few times, and then you start to put it together. So the Army gave me invaluable experience. It also kind of, um, I think, cemented that I did not want to do that for the rest of my life. I probably could have made it. My wife didn't like the Army. My second job, they already told me toward the end of my tour I was going to Korea as a counterintelligence agent. agent. I did not want to spy on our own people. So, it, so they all lined up. I got all the answers I wanted not to do that. Then the question is, okay, I resigned from the Army. They tell me you can go. Now what? And I also knew I was a business degree um, uh, in college. Wasn't smart enough to do accounting, so I didn't get the BBA like most of my um, business uh, uh, classmates. I got a straight uh, BS in economics. Why would you get a BS in economics? Anybody else in here got an economics degree? Are you in economics? Why do you get that kind of degree? Because I couldn't do accounting. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're a good writer in economics, you can make any arguments, like being a lawyer. You don't have to be right. You've got to be able to articulate what the position you're on. And I had one professor who loved the way I wrote. I took every class he taught, and I made good, good grades. So my point is I got a business degree because I want to do business, but I didn't want to be a CPA. I didn't really you know, get the, fifth, the, the Madison Avenue marketing piece, but I said I want to be in business because my father-in-law, not, not at the time I was in college, but my future father-in-law worked for Coca-Cola. I said I think I want to do that. So I leave the Army. I go do that. 
and um, do the bottling distribution side. I won't get into all the details of that, but again, I had people responsibility. The first sales center I ran had 25 employees. <clears throat> Second sales center I had 50 employees. I was responsible for a P&L or profit and loss statement, a budget. I had to show that I could make profit. I had to control brand plans, um, all the, the issues that come with managing people. Again, a great learning environment where I was able to make mistakes, learn how to do the job, uh, learn to lead people and then you know build on that did that for five years decided I didn't like getting boxes of coca-cola from the warehouse to the shelf I wanted to get into the more marketing and branding side went to the coca-cola company again thought I'd hit the lottery I'm walking through corporate headquarters on North Avenue in Atlanta. There's more art in the, in the there's more, the, the art in the um, lobby of the Coca-Cola building is worth more money than I'll ever make in my life. I'm seeing these pictures and they're telling me this is worth a million dollars and it's all marble. And I thought, I'm, I've died and gone to heaven. I'll never do anything but what I'm doing now. Well, things change. You leave the lobby, you get out in the field, you start dealing with food line managers or Kroger managers or the little uh, convenience store operator and you realize it's not as glamorous as that Fort North Avenue headquarters. But I still spent five years uh, both in uh, Chattanooga and Augusta learning branding, learning marketing and um, kind of again solidifying what I might do in business. This is all leading somewhere I promise you. Um, but after five years of that I was tired of moving. I'd moved about eight times at that point. Tired of starting over and I got an opportunity from a customer, a former customer of mine, to go into the beer business. And I went to the beer business for two reasons. I'm tired of moving, want stability for my family, and they promised me a whole lot of money. And guess what? One of those was a valid reason to make a decision. The second one was not. And it took me eight years of being not very happy with the, the job I was doing. I'm back to getting boxes of beer, or kegs of beer, from point A to point B. We had marketing plans, we had customer relationships, we had profit and loss statements, we managed people, but I was still doing the same function. I'm getting product from A to B so that you can buy it. Not very fulfilling. And it um, took about five years of being very irritable, kind of that burr under the saddle, um, of knowing that's not where I'm gonna be the rest of my life. So, lane brain idea comes out of the left field that I might wanna run for office. Went to uh, talk to some people I respected, said, I might do this, what do I do? This individual I trusted said, you need to run for my office, I'm not running next time. This happens to be chairman of the county board of commissioners. So it's a $40 million budget. It's managing 700 employees. It's a, a board of five vo voting members, including the chairman, which I was, and then dealing with all these issues from economic development to public safety to roads. Um, fun, uh, overwhelming scary. I ran thinking I'll get, I'll get to learn how to run for office and maybe one day serve. I didn't run thinking I'd ever win. And, then, and we were successful. And now I've got to go serve. I've got to go be this chairperson, age 40 I think, 38 or 40, and, and deal with these political issues. The good news is it taught me that public service is, is, is really starting to jive with my passion. I didn't care as much about the profit and loss. I didn't care as much about whether we hit our brand plan. I did that to, to provide the paycheck for my family, but I got really interested in servant leadership, working for the community, working for the betterment of our community. Um, fast forward another three years, and the company I worked for sells before I become an owner. No more the, 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 the financial carrot out there in the future. I'm going to be just an employee. And so, uh, thankfully, the Chamber of Commerce was open. I had no idea what chambers do. I got a call and it said, would you consider putting your name in the hat? I had to have a job. I want to move to Atlanta and start all over again. I said, sure, I got nothing to lose. At age 42, I find my purpose in life. Now, why is that important? Some of you may know that today. You may have uh, been, been planning for your whole career that you want to get your MBA and that you're going to start a business and you want to be the next Jeff Bezos or any other entrepreneur that you think is successful. Most of us don't know that. We're trying to find what really uh, energizes us, what gets us excited, what when we finish the task we feel good about that effort and then put that into some kind of perspective. So the quicker, the lesson from all of that is, my, my dad jokes I can't keep a job, 
that's fair. He stayed with the same. He stayed with the post office 34 years. That doesn't happen anymore. Very few of us are going to be with one organization very long. Um, that passion, the quicker you can come to, excuse me, that purpose, when you say, this really is what motivates me. This is that North Star. This is that hill I should be climbing or attacking. These activities or these roles are going to fulfill me at some point in life. And so you zero in on that, and, and you get some validation through doing something related to it. Then you may find that you become really passionate about that, whatever it is. So you're going to work harder because you're passionate now. So I say that passion plus purpose equals alignment. I'm, I'm as um, stressed out today as I've ever been. I'm also the most fulfilled. How can that happen? How can you be the most stressed out and the most fulfilled at the same time? And audience participation. Sir? Huh? Okay. What else? That's what, that's what can contribute to your stress is because you're you are passionate and you know this is what you want to do and you want to do the best that you can at it. And if you feel like you're not oh. possibly doing the best. If our sales goal at Budweiser was to sell 2.3 million cases and we wound up with 2.29999, I really didn't lose a whole lot of sleep over it. Okay, next year we'll do better. We need to re reformulate our goals, make sure the brand strategy is right. Are we getting the execution in the market? Are we getting the right contracts with our customers? But I didn't lose any sleep over it. I lose sleep now over things that don't happen. Typically because either there's a barrier I can't control, political, financial, um, could be timing, or it could be it's not the idea, no matter how good, isn't ready, isn't ready yet for acceptance. I'm there, John may be there in his role at CSU. Rick may be there as a business owner. Jason is the leader of Georgia Power. We may all be on the same page, but there's somebody else that's got to be in the tent. Oh, that's not going to happen. And so my stress comes from the frustration of even great ideas, you know, no-brainers, not happening because there's something that's impeding that. And I've got to work, my team and I, and working with other people, have to make sure that we are solving those problems on a regular basis. You know, something like, I'll give you a number. Uh, how many people have any idea how many posted open jobs there are in our region? How many open, meaning, meaning a company has said, I'll hire this position if the right fit. How many, how many open jobs we have in the region? Take a guess, 100? 500? Thousands, how many thousands? Three thousand. It's somewhere uh, north of 3,000, south of 5,000. I can't quite get an accurate number, but it's thousands. How many unemployed people? Meaning people who say, I would go to work tomorrow if I found the job I wanted. How many of those are open? So, hmm? so, yeah, triple. Double to triple. We don't know. I mean, our, our, our best Department of Labor numbers say that it's around 8,000, roughly. But that changes month to month. But So, as a society, you got 4,000 people. I mean, 4,000 jobs that a company or an organization is willing to pay somebody to do. They've put it out there to be, you know, to entertain candidates and then hire somebody. And 8,000 people who say they want to work. There's something going on there. And therefore, our economy is uh, weaker than what we call our peer cities. I just got some numbers yesterday. Augusta has, a, Augusta's the same size we are. 200,000, roughly. They have added 7,000 jobs, meaning they've added them to the payroll of their workforce in the last 12 months. How many have we added? Take a guess. Not 7,000. 400. We're dead equal with Albany, and not to put my friends down in Albany, much smaller, got many more issues facing them. They've added just as many jobs as we have. And that's on me and my team. And we've got to figure out how to make, um, make that number do better. And that's everything from branding. It's everything from uh, incentives that we have to employ. It's everything from, I mean, I, mean, <clears throat> I like to get answers first. How many believe uh, that, that crime and crime instances are a problem for our community? Should be a few more hands than three. So number one problem for economic development. Let me tell you why. It's not this is bad enough that we've got people harming each other. It's bad enough we've got people that um, that your property is not safe. It's being taken. But it's one of those indicators that if I'm a site selection, I'm, per, I'm somebody that helps companies move or put investments in another community. If I go online and I look at everything about Columbus, 
those numbers can hurt us. They can show us that we're not the place that company ought to spend money. Again, that's on me and my team. It's on the mayor and council. It's on leaders like these guys in the back. It's on you because we all have a vested interest to make Columbus the best it can be. So, now you got a little, little feel for what chambers do. Um, we could be doing just the Christmas parade or um, the networking that we're known for, and that's all important. We need to have small businesses be able to come to a breakfast or an after hours event and exchange business cards, get to know how do I do business with you, how do you do business with me, that's important. But what we really do on a regular basis is political affairs, working with our elected officials, getting the right ones elected. I don't mean that, 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 that there's a litmus test, but it's how do we educate you that this is the issues important to the business community or, interested, or of interest to the community. We do military affairs. We work with Fort Benning leadership to make sure that we can uh, keep them as strong as possible. If there's a political element to the budget, if it's getting another unit out there, we work with General Wesley. Um, economic development, I've got a team that is regularly going to trade shows and working with our state partners to bring prospects here so they can say, yes, we're going to expand our company. We make Widget X and we need to build another facility. We want them to do it here. So we're doing that every day. Um, small business development, you know, it's, it's not for us to go help you start your business, meaning we can't just go give you a building because we don't know what your idea is. But if you say, I've got this great idea and I've got a business plan, we ought to help you connect the other dots, whether it be finding capital, whether it be finding employees, whether it be all the things that help you be successful. That's another uh, piece of what we do. So now that you understand what chambers uh, do, um, let me connect the dots a few a little bit more around uh, the purpose piece because I'm I'm dead serious about this. Um, how are you going to get to purpose and passion? Let's go back. This, uh, we, I've answered a little bit, but what are some ways that if you leave here tomorrow with your shingle, your diploma, what's going to help you? Those building blocks of finding that alignment. People that you surround yourself with and or interact with. How many of you will leave here tomorrow with a professor you will not forget? We've all got at least one, right? And, and I'm telling you, there's some that I'm not sure I ever took their class. I forgot them so quick. But most of the ones that were really good, I could call them today. Some of them aren't alive, but those that are. And, and sit down with them, and it would be just like we never stopped. They were that impactful in my life. You'll have the same thing happen outside of this institution. You'll have it in your, you may have it in a job you do now um, uh, as a part-time job or how you're helping provide for school. Don't, don't discount the people element. And the second part of that is not only surround yourself with good people, disassociate with bad people. I don't mean bad as far as um, that I think everybody was, was created to be as good as possible. But if they're not adding value to your life or they're not helping you move forward, you might need to reevaluate re that relationship or at least minimize it. I mean, I've got some family members I can't just get rid of, but I don't have to go sit around with them every day either <laughs> or let them call me every time they got a problem. Find a way to have people that can surround you and they become that, that extra uh, quotient to the purpose versus passion equals alignment. Um, people also provide that inertia or that momentum. So let's say you've got your, your, your education, you've got some decent part-time work you've done, you've done some internships, you've got a little experience. Now you're going out to your first real job. Uh, the people that you choose to help you, whether they're a coworker, uh, your mentor, leader that you're working for, or somebody outside the organization, help get them to 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 do for you what can move you forward in a better uh, momentum than not. A couple of examples. I had one example at Coca-Cola. We did this whole exercise of understanding our personalities. I think it was called the Brain Matrix Study or something. I was a green versus a yellow. And there was a girl on our staff. She and I just could not even speak to each other, not get in an argument. And I'm not an arguing kind of guy, but it's just something about, I got on her nerves, she got on my nerves. We do this study, we understand, we understand very quickly what drives us, what, what were our hot buttons, we never had a problem after that. You may not have an opportunity to do that kind of study tomorrow. Myers-Briggs, another one. Anybody got any other? There's a couple of them out there. Um, Strengths 2.0, that's a book you can buy and actually take an assessment. The point of that is, don't assume you're always right. I did. She was. She just had, had no clue what she was doing. And the quicker we got rid of her, the better everything was going to be. I was as much the problem as she was. My point is, you're going to have that happen no matter what. It's a part-time role, a full-time role, a volunteer role. Learn that people can either move you forward, slow you down, but how you put it in perspective is going to be the important point. Uh, evaluate what, you, what you're bringing to the, 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 the equation. 
Um, trial and error. You've seen from my bio and what I told you already that I've tried a lot of things, but each one of those built into the next. I could take something from whatever role I've had and build on it to the next one. And now, uh, I think I'm a pretty decent chamber guy. And I say decent because of measurements I can pull, but at least I've got probably the most well-rounded background of most of my peers. I didn't start in chamber world right out of college. I didn't only learn membership campaigns one way. I didn't learn political um, and, and political affairs or government affairs one way. My way of going after those things and, and leading our team is a sum of all my experience. This worked here, that did not work there, and by analyzing both of those, we come to hopefully a better answer. But it took all of that. I wouldn't discount my time at the beer distributor, although it was not a very fun eight years. I kind of felt like I was going through the motions every day. But I took all the things I learned, both people management and leadership skills from that role. Uh, county commission, my first two years as a chairman, the only power I had was to control the agenda. Nothing got posted or put out as the illegal agenda unless I agreed to it. I didn't get to vote unless it was a tie. I didn't get to tell people how to vote, but I could control the agenda. I had two people, two county commissioners, that came into office because they did not like the employees of the county. Their whole purpose was to fire every employee of the county. Never figured out exactly why they didn't like these people, but they were going to disrupt the lives of hundreds of people if they had their way. So I played defense for two solid years. I was in the minority. There was me and one other person that felt we had a pretty good team and we shouldn't disrupt that way. And so I had to keep the other three from getting that on the agenda so they could fire. And they were going to start, you know, the county administrator first, then the public works director, then the HR manager. They were going to just go through and make political footballs out of all these people who devoted their life to public service. So two years, and I'm, I'm not exaggerating, I'd play stupid. On Fridays, they'd call me and go, I didn't see that on that agenda, the executive session to fire Joe. Ah, Dad, coming, I forgot again. I'll get you next week. <laughs> and it worked. And then there's other times that I used legal maneuvering that I could, you know, we forgot to post an executive session, whatever. I, I did all the little things because I was not going to let people be ne negatively affected because people had the wrong agenda. They had the wrong purpose of what they were trying to bring to that, to that service. At the end of those two years, it was fun. We had another guy get elected and more moderate and, and saw both sides of the equation. And we began to work with a different county manager to build confidence in the commissioners that these people did really good work. So my, again, my point to that is every one of those, those chapters built on the other one. Um, I just want to spend some time on servant leadership and running out of time. Let me, let me read you something and then get your reaction. This book I got told about probably four or five years ago, written by Jim Clifton, who's the chairman of the Gallup Corporation. If you don't know Gallup, they do every kind of survey and data collection you can imagine. Been doing it for 75 years. This book's called The Coming Jobs War. He opens the, the introductory sentence says, The coming world war is an all-out global war for good jobs. And if you watch CNN, Fox, ABC, NPR for the next 30 minutes, are you going to hear about jobs as much as you're going to hear about maybe four or five other issues? What might you hear? Trump. Trump? <laughs> Korea? Yeah. Um, protesting? Congress is broken? I mean, you can pick any number. You're not, and this is the, they got all the data that's been collected for, uh, for years. And they're saying the coming war is a war for good jobs. Let me give you one more paragraph. This is him speaking. If you were to ask me from all the world polling Gallup has done for more than 75 years, what would fix the world? What would suddenly create a worldwide peace, global well-being, and the, and the extraordinary advancements in human development? I would say the immediate appearance of 1.8 billion jobs. I'm not going to go through all the reasons he gets to that number, but 1.8 billion jobs. How many people are on Earth right now, roughly? Seven-ish. And we need 1.8 billion good jobs. Now he goes into quantifying what a good job is. not working part-time just to earn a paycheck to, to provide my basic needs. It's a job that helps you earn the income to better your family, whatever that, 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 that month number. If it's just you and, a, and your spouse or be, uh, a significant other, it's, it's one value. If it's you and a family, it's another. But the point is, we've got work to be doing on job creation 
in job development, not this other stuff that's becoming a distraction. And I truly believe the cynic in me, I've been doing politics a while, the cynic in me says the news organizations and Congress and most elected officials, not most, a large number of elected officials, use these other things to distract us so we're not focusing on this. So it's incumbent upon us as citizens, as voters, and for people in my job, and certainly supported by these other business leaders who are on my board and who serve other uh, community agencies in this community, in this region, in this state, it's up to us not to get distracted, not to chase the, the brightest distraction, but to focus on what we can do. So let me put that in, maybe a little more granular. If um, the dean here or President Markwood told me that all 8,000 students at CSU who become 1,500 graduates uh, are not going to be able to earn the, the living they expect to learn upon graduation, that's just the way it is. Is that satis Is that okay? Did you come here for that promise? Yeah. You're paying pretty heavy to be here, right? Guess what? So are some other people. Taxpayers, your mom and dad, all of us are vested into your education, just like we are with K through 12, just like we are at the technical college. It isn't just your dollar. That's something I think people, people miss is that well, just because you pay some tuition, you do, you and your family, but so does the taxpayer. We're subsidizing education. So does grants and foundations, the private entity. This university has benefited to the tune of about $200 million in private capital coming to this university for your success. If we don't use that appropriately, we've all failed. We've created financial malpractice or any other term you have to it. So I'm motivated every day that I want Dr. Markwood to say, guess what? Last May, we graduated 1,500. They were all employed, not only in a good job, but with better than they expected. And next year, we're going to make it 1,800 or 2,000. Because I can't stop, nor can the people I get to work with, until there's um, uh, 8,000 more employed people and no jobs posted. We're getting everybody a job that wants to be. Because it's not about just fulfilling that job that you can you know, serve coffee or uh, clean the streets or work at the car wash. They're going to always be those that need to happen. But they can also be replaced. We're going to do the fastest automation and technology revolution probably in our history. That's going to continue. It isn't China, Korea, Vietnam, like many people want to talk about. It's some of that. It did happen with textiles to a degree. But right now, it's automation. Companies are figuring out, uh, they would robot me if they could. I mean, I don't, I mean it, it, but I'd be hard. It'd be hard to find somebody that simply answers the phone because I'm lucky that I do bring some mental value. This, this experience I've gone through, I get to work with these other leaders. It'd be hard to automate what I do. But it's possible. We definitely can automate our receptionist. We already have. I just don't choose to do it. I don't, will not use a voicemail to, to speak to our, to our members. Um, can we automate professors? Y'all don't get, don't get nervous. We're okay. <laughs> can we automate professors? Hmm? In a way, half the classes how? online anyway. Half the class is online. When I went to school, there was no online. That's how old I am. <coughs> But now, yes, a professor who's very good, and we should, if they're that good a professor in engaging you and making you the best you can be, we ought to make sure they're broadcasted to millions of students. It's also efficient. Why can't a professor who's engaging their class, getting the interaction here, be broadcast somewhere else? Makes sense. So that means there could be less professors. But guess what? There really aren't enough professors now. Is that still true? There really aren't enough qualified professors. Truck drivers. Do you think we don't want somebody behind the wheel as a society? I feel a lot better if I at least know somebody's trying to drive that thing. Why are we automating then? Saving money. That's what people talk about. And it could. And saving them time. We don't have enough truck drivers. With all the schools and all the training programs, we right now have a shortage of some 100,000 truck drivers. Nurses, high paying, uh, fulfilling jobs. We don't have enough nurses. So the point to all that is, you're, you're doing step one well. You've decided that you want to go potem uh, potentially into fields that require a four-year degree. I would hope you've evaluated whether your degree in business school is always a pretty good bet. I wouldn't really say that about, anybody teach philosophy in here? 
<laughs> we'll pick on it a little bit. If you want to be a, prof a professor, if you want to be a, a minister, maybe even a lawyer, philosophy might be your path. But if you want to go get a philosophy degree and you have no idea what you're going to do, you're probably going to struggle to get a job. You used to could get a job in business if you just had a degree. We would, we would kind of, you know, okay, well it's, it's some of these other degrees. Not now. If your degree is not linked to an outcome or to a, to a, to a role, you're not going to see that. That's why we have so many open jobs. Every city is struggling with this. Um, I'm trying not to go over. Let's stop there. I think that's a good po point just, just to have some more Q&A and just to hear from you guys. But let me sum up why you think of your first question. Um, you've done step one well. When you get to step two, that's deciding what you do next. Really use the people part. Talk to your professors. I'm on my own children this. My son actually was a psychology major for about eight months. And so that's fine. You do whatever you want to do. But by spring break, I need to know a plan of what you're going to do, how much you're going to earn, and how it's going to fulfill you. Call me at spring break, see if he's changing his major. Because he, he did the homework. And he was told, whether rightly or wrongly, by the academic staff that if you this pathway means a master's, a doctorate, and it pays $42,000 a year. Now, he didn't make $42,000 when he started out out of college with a business degree, but he's now making a lot more than that because he got alignment with his schooling and his experience and somewhat what he wants to do. I don't think he wants to sell carpet his whole life, but right now it's a good place that he's learning the business world, selling a product, dealing with people, dealing with customers. Um, and that's what you're going to have to do. Regardless of where you go, you've got to get that experience. And then the third piece, I'd say, uh, ask your qu ask, continuously ask yourself, am I looking at alignment or purpose or goal appropriately? Because you can, you can wake up one day and go, man, five years just went by. And I don't really know what I did with it. And I don't, but I also know I didn't really love it. Life's too short. Try to, try to shorten that learning cycle that you've got passion plus purpose plus people equals alignment a little quicker as you can. So that's enough of that. Questions? Comments? Disagreement? Yes, ma'am. What is the disconnect between all these open jobs and all these people trying to get these jobs? What makes it so hard for them to get these jobs besides education? Yeah. Two things, at least the two things I can speak to somewhat articulately because we, we're, ask, we're asking that. The first one is there's, there's some um, a misalignment with skill training and education, meaning I might have spent 40 years, let's say I'm, I'm, I'm 40 years old, but I spent 15 years doing that job X and that job's now gone. The carpet industry went completely automated after the downturn. 2009 used to be run by your hands and you could program a piece of equipment with your hands and mind. Now a computer does it all. If you can't program the computer, you can't do the job. There's a lot of displacement in, in manufacturing because people who used to could work with their hands and equipment now can't do the computer skills. So misalignment of skill set and education is one. Um, the second is soft skills. And that simply means that you're willing to come to work when you're supposed to come to work. You will, you will do the job for the time period you're supposed to do it. Uh, you can pass a drug test. That may be a sensitive, uh, my, my own children argue with me on that one, but right now the law says you cannot be impaired for workman's comp reasons and otherwise, so you can't go do a job that you're dealing with heavy machinery and be under the, effect, the effects of some element. So if you can't pass a drug test, you're not going to be employed by most employers. That's challenging society right now. There are some people who are broadcasting. We do drug tests next Thursday. So you have time not to get in trouble. But my point is soft skills, you not being equipped to do the workplace environment is the other part. So they might have been employed and then now they can't get reemployed because of those issues. Anybody want to add any of those, John, Jason? I've heard it repeatedly from businesses in the past where they need to see a computer. Yeah. We can train you to be an accountant. So we're working more on developing those types of soft skills, writing, punctuality, understanding what a professional environment is about, communication, things like that. Anybody here been on a farm lately? For any purpose? What did you do on the farm? Uh, I went to take some photos for a project. God, you might be on a real farm and got your hands dirty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, my children couldn't find a farm. If I said, go your goal today is for this much money, they would know where to look, would know if they, got, if they stumbled upon it, that they were on it. The farm and the home, home unit and all the things we did, when, and I'm not that old, but I spent time from probably 
five years of age to ten doing something around a farm. I learned work ethic. I learned it's hot and miserable to do some jobs. I learned you got to just power through it. I learned that it takes preparation. There's actually a video Franklin Covey uses for his training that talks about the law of the harvest. If you understand how Mother Nature works, you're going to be a pretty good employee because the world isn't about you. It's about the world, and the quicker you can tie into that, the better. So, unfortunately, y'all don't grow up that way. My children didn't grow up that way, so you've lost some of that development that happened very early. And then our school systems, not because they're bad at, at planning, our school systems were told, teach to the test, or make sure you can pass a certain a battery of tests. We quit talking about teamwork. Uh, communication skills, interpersonal skills. We said go in the classroom, be as smart as you can, pass the test, and maybe you'll figure that other stuff on the playground or on the ball field. Now nobody plays sports anymore, so it, it all has compounded to where we've got this soft skill issue and so we're all trying to figure it out. We're trying now to teach K through 12 that you got to teach interpersonal skills and critical thinking because anybody can read a book and take a test. I mean, I don't, I mean not anybody, but most people can. But learning how to work with other people is, is difficult. And I, I learned a lot on the ball field. When you can't get along with a teammate, it shows up real quick. You lose. And then the coach makes you run laps. I don't like running. So I didn't like to run laps. So you learn real quick, forced behavior. Good question. Come on. Yes, sir. How important is getting experience in the real world while in school? For example, um, working in a management position that doesn't require a degree while you're also going to college. Critical. Any experience. Jim in here works for us at the chamber. How glamorous is your job? Glamorous? Yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I see him every day. It isn't glamorous, but I did exactly what he did in college and in high school. Uh, we hire as many interns as we can. Some paid, some not paid. We don't try to get across with the school, but if we, you can get college credit, we'll follow that path. If, if you uh, bring skill set, you can help us. I'm happy to pay. We want, and I think a lot of businesses will tell you right now, they'll do anything they can to get you in their operation to help you learn, to help you get that experience. So it doesn't matter. When you put on your resume, you don't have to put, I don't think I'm being, violating any rules, but I don't think you got to state I was unpaid and did nothing. I can make a very good statement of what Tommy does for us every day on his resume, and it's all factual. Doesn't know a lot of money at it, certainly not glamorous, but wherever he goes, he's going to show, I can work with people, I can be told a task, I can get it done, and I was a valuable member of the team. That's all you need. So it doesn't matter what you do. But if you can get experience within your field, it seems better. So whether it be you're in business, you're accounting, then maybe you can go intern for the summer or during tax season. You may simply do not, you may not do anything other than take the returns that an accountant's had to review and copy them or package them or electronically file them for the, for the um, taxpayer. Doesn't matter. You're seeing that operation. You're getting some experience. You're figuring out whether you really want to do that. Because you go today and talk to an accounting professor, they're probably going to tell you, yes, yeah, CPAs make a whole lot of money, and they do. But their life from January to April is a little challenging. Yes, sir? So, a follow-up question. How important do you think your real-world experience that you learned while you were in the workforce versus what you learned in college or can you do now? Um, you got to have the academic background. You have to. But it simply points you in the right direction to go learn the more critical skill. Give you an example. The Army will not let you do anything without an education. I don't care what MOS you go into the Army, whether it be an intelligence officer, which requires six months of school. The longest path that the Army has. I went from college, four years of college, to basically 8.30 to 4.30 every day for six months to become an intelligence officer. And you know how much I knew? I could recognize a Russian jet fighter. I could do mapping, but I really still didn't know the job till I got in the function and had other people go. When the general gets ready for the battlefield that you just prepared the illustrations for, one mistake can cost a life. So yeah, I knew how to do all the symbols. I was pretty colorful, but I had no idea the implication. I, I, let me give you a couple, one quick story. Uh, one day we were out in West Texas, my job in the field, I mean, we were out training, was to brief the general in the morning as to what was going to happen that day, what we called enemy forces. My part of enemy forces was um, the weather, the uh, logistical issues, 
and uh, terrain. And then my partner, uh, my colleague, he talked about the real enemy, the, the other force. So I get the weather report from the Air Force. It says it's going to be a beautiful day. Our general, Toast Two Star, uh, happens to have a three star uh, Brazilian general in town. So at 5 o'clock in the morning, I give him the weather report. He says, how much you want to put your life on that weather report, Lieutenant? I said, sir, we're good. And it rained all day. <laughs> the next morning wasn't very fun. Uh, he used to call me Lieutenant Anderson. I became Andy. Dumb Andy. <laughs> and for weeks, he reminded me I couldn't read a weather report. Now, my, gen my colonel that I worked for made me go buy a transistor radio. You may know what transistor radio is. Y'all don't have a clue. It's back before FM and digital. And AM radio so I could listen to the Fort Worth, Texas weather report. Not the Air Force because they were dumb. <laughs> so you think I ever messed up a weather report again? Nope. And thank goodness it was just an exercise. Nobody died because of what I did. But what if I was that cavalier? Maybe I, I mean, I, maybe I did anything right. It just was a bad day. I mean, weather, the weatherman had the best job in the world. You're never right and you always stay employed. <laughs> but anyway, that was, a, that was a very lifelong, so experience, nothing in the classroom would ever taught me that. I had to live through embarrassment, um, fear. I'll give you one other quick one. The Army's always full of, full of them. Um, I worked in a secure facility, top secret facility that sounds awful, whatever, but a Marine, the only guy on the, on, the, on the base that had a real gun and a bullet like Barney Fife was a Marine that guarded us. Every shift, there was a Marine out there, and he was to keep anybody out of that skiff. When we went to the field, we took all our classified material into a portable safe, loaded it onto the vans, and we had to secure the facility, which meant we had to lock the door and turn the dial in the combination so many times. It wasn't my responsibility, but I was typically there with the lieutenant who was. We go out and do our field exercise, we come back, we're tired, we're dirty, load everything back up. It's about six o'clock at night, and I get a call from my boss, a, cap a, a captain, and he says, uh, you and Lieutenant so-and-so need to get to the general's office now. Now, I'm a, I'm a first lieutenant. I had no, I would, I would, I probably didn't even know where his office was. But we figured it out, and we get there. And when I get, I get, I'm a few minutes after her, and he's got her for eight rest at the front of his desk, and he's as red as they come. And he'd already been chewing her out pretty good. And he says, Lieutenant Anderson, how many times did Lieutenant Flo Welling turn the dial on the door? Um, Ten days ago, it's five o'clock in the morning. I, Sir, I have no idea. Can you, can you commit that she turned the dial the number of times that the protocol says? No, sir, I cannot. All right, you're dismissed. I leave. I find out later that he did not kick her out of the Army, but he put a letter in her file that meant she would never make captain. So, academics are critical. They're your foundation to put everything else on. But it's till you get into the real world of whatever that job is that you're making decisions. You're gonna, you, you may be uh, third shift at a plant or maybe um, a, a, the, the day shift supervisor at an uh, insurance agency. And you may think something very mediocre comes across your table or office desk and you, you give it that kind of, I just phoned it in and then later realize how important it is. Don't. You don't have to. Take a little extra time. Do what you need to do. Think, think about everything and the importance that it is. Now, if my staff comes to me and says that they're really worried about uh, whether or not we have enough Cokes in the refrigerator at work, I'm probably not going to give them a very good answer. I like, will solve it. But if somebody comes to me and says, did you know that CSU um, lost some of their funding this, this particular legislative cycle because we didn't do something, something, something? I'm pretty hot now because that should never happen because that impacts you. If there's $12 million or $15 million, those are $500 that didn't get done because of something we could have prevented, then, then I, I get pretty squirrely on that. Good questions. Yes, sir. I know you talked about the importance of who you associate with. Mm -hmm. um, I know Mr. Kevin Blair from Synovus. I wouldn't call him necessarily a friend, but I associate with him. My question is, there's a little bit of an age disparity and also a background. Dis I wouldn't say background, but I didn't come from the best background. I also did military service. Um, how, how would, what would your advice be for those of us that are in our, you know, mid to late twenties, people that we need to be associating with are, you know, these mm -hmm. late forties, early fifties business leaders. It's a little awkward to, 
try to make that your peer group, what would you say would be the best means of making that happen? There, there are, but it's not easy. And don't, don't discount that it is. But don't let not being easy not encourage you. Um, don't worry about their, their title. I got a lot of fancy titles. They don't mean a whole lot. Um, my uh, staff member, my colleague on staff that leads our Leadership Columbus and Young Professional Program for two years in a row now said, you're going to be a mentor to the young professionals. I went, I don't really have time. Can you, you know? And then she reminds me that's my job. I don't have time. And um, I worry that because I've done it twice in a row now, I'm going to you know, give bad advice or I, I start repeating myself or maybe there's somebody better. Then I realize I've lived through a lot of these things. So if, if I can do it, if I've got time, I have to. It's important to you. We've got eight or ten of those now. Jason, have you done that? Okay, we've got eight or ten of those that meet with four or five young professionals every month. And, and there's other opportunities like that, whether it be through the Chamber of Young Professionals. Court companies have now these kind of programs. So, so find them and don't, don't worry about that so-and-so's got a title or they're, they're more important. None of us are more important to anybody. It's what we're doing. And so if I can help you, you just got to make me understand I need to do that. So ask me. Nine times out of ten, if, if you're not getting those relationships, um, it may be because you, you're you're limiting yourself. You're saying, I, I can't go ask them. They're too important. Ask them. Well, you'll say no, or I, I don't have time. But hey, typically, if anybody's worth their salt, they're going to say, I really can't do whatever, but I want, you, I want to introduce you to so-and-so. So that's how you network, is you find a path that gets you um, uh, into the circle of people that can give you added value. Don't worry about status. And We all come from a lot of different places. You'd be surprised where I came from. Yes, sir. Do you have a business incubator here, or do we have one in the city? We do in title. I think Kurt would add that we don't have the, the ecosystem. We've got some pieces of, of if you want to be an entrepreneur, we might can help you somewhere along the path. But we just went on a, a, on a more deliberate path of creating that ecosystem. We hired a guy named Frank Brasky, who's an entrepreneur by many definitions, but um, working with great people, other entrepreneur-minded people, other serial entrepreneurs. So we hope to have everything from an incubator to an accelerator to a make it space so that no matter where you come in on the, spec uh, the, 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 the continuum, I don't have a clue other than I got an idea. Well, you need to go here. I got a clue. I got a great product. I've got capital and a business plan. You need to go over here. And then we can help you from that point. But right now, the data from our Columbus 2025 plan showed that we are under-indexed for small business development and entrepreneurism, which means our economy, therefore, is suffering. So we got to do that as much as we try to go recruit another company to come here. Oh, I saw a hand, didn't I? Yes, sir. Um, you said that you, when we run the office, uh, you expected to get the experience from running instead of winning. What advice would you give your younger self at that time, or I guess in that mindset? Uh, <clears throat> um, I did. I did. I expected to lose. Matter of fact, I had some people I respected. I went to tell them. Um, said you're not going to lose. You're going to lose bad. So I got nothing to lose then, because I can, you got to learn how to, run a camp, how to run a campaign, how to raise money, how to talk to people. I mean, you, if you're running for any kind of office, you're probably going to be in front of audiences a number of times trying to articulate what you stand for. And so I said, if nothing else, I'll learn that piece, and then I'll lose, and I might remember something else later, and I might be successful. So I would tell you, I shouldn't have, I should have been more confident in losing. Just go for it, if that's what I wanted to do. What, what could happen? I lost, I did not lose one of my, dollar of my own money. And we spent $28,000 for a county commission job that paid eight. The reason is, that community wanted somebody to beat this other guy. He was not good for the community, so I got lucky. They didn't know me, they didn't like him. <laughs> so they gave me a lot of money, let me make mistakes. I won and went, oh goodness, I'm the dog, I'm the dog that caught the car. But I learned four years. I would have done it again, but my job changed. And I wasn't going to run for office, hopefully get elected, and then my job changed and I have to move. So I chose not to run for re-election until I worked out the job thing. Will I ever run for again? Possible. But right now, I get to do politics probably half my day. I influence state, federal, and local. So I'm not one vote. I influence multiple votes. And I say I, working with a lot of people. So I don't have to worry about just being, again, one vote at the state legislature or on city council. We try to make sure the whole body votes the way is good for business and good for the community. Yes, ma'am? What do you give the students 
explanation of what the Chamber of Commerce does. She's a sink, meaning we get run on time. Good, good prep. Um, you know, we, every community, every chamber literally is different because they've set it up in a different way or they've got a different, um, the citizenry expects to. So I didn't know anything we did other than we were something business when I started the job. So, and I also inherited some problems. There was money problems, there was political relevance issues. So I got to use my business skills to kind of figure it out. And so I met with 100 leaders in 92 days when I first took over Dalton. And it was simply, you're the mayor, you own Company X, you're a doctor, what would you want out of your chamber? And after 90, I mean 100 of those calls, I had a pretty clear message. This was 2008, our unemployment had gone from three and a half to 13 and a half in a year. It was jobs, jobs, jobs. So I said, great, we're gonna do economic development. I went out and raised $3 million, we hired some staff and we started doing economic development. So here, the same kind of thing. I got here, okay, as Columbus got the same interp interpretation of their chamber role. Met with about 96 leaders. What do you want out of us? Validated that and now we're doing it. So we already were doing economic development, political affairs, military, but in Columbus 2025, which I have time today, but certainly welcome to give you all uh, a snapshot of that. But our community strategic plan uh, has further aligned what we do. We are more in, in the trenches of workforce than ever. We are meeting with K through 12 leaders, with CSU leaders, Columbus Tech leaders, uh, future employees. How do we make this alignment of workforce and unemployed people tighter every day? Because if you go ask any company that's looking to expand right now, I don't care if they're a local cupcake bakery, to Pratt and Whitney, they're all going to tell you their biggest problem is workforce or available of a qualified workforce. So until we figure that out, that's what keeps me going. That's succinct enough. Okay. Yes, sir. A quick comment here. Uh, I, I think information systems on the management side. Mm -hmm. and, and I think one of the reasons for that discipline to be created several years ago was to provide technical skills with a combination of soft skills. And I foresee us doing, you know, more of that here. And so, so I, you know, I'm just shouting out about my department, and that's the mm -hmm. way I think it should be. Well, I think it's no different than if you came into my office tomorrow and said, or you'd go, you, you should be doing this as a chamber. So how, we, how do we all, you know, we're both creating a product for the future use of the community. How do we make sure we're both doing it well? And so I think whether it be information technology, general business, um, creating an infrastructure that business can be successful here, all of that plays into it. So, yeah, I was an entrepreneur <coughs> for, for some time. And, and so I have a lot of interest in entrepreneurship, and I do have an interest in, in, in talking to you about this, and how can we yep. help improve our programs here, or what can we uh, provide? Yeah, send me, send me your contact because we, again, the other thing of Columbus 2025 is not just a chamber plan, a city council plan, it's the community. So there's about 250 volunteers, meaning people who do something else for a living, but are working on this, whether it be education, talented development, uh, educated people, targeted economic growth, branding. We've got a place if you want to figure out what happens with strategic planning and how to make a community better, we could use you. So just let me know your interest. I'll take one more for time and then I can stick around for a few minutes if somebody wants to speak afterwards. Is there another question, burning question? I'm sorry, yes, yes ma'am. What would you say your most um, challenging aspect is for being a CEO? Hmm. Lately, for me personally, it's time management and issue management. I thought at this point, I've been here two and a half years, I would have a better, better handle on where we ought to be and are making a little more progress, but we're not there. Our team's not quite where it needs to be to do the things y'all are asking us to do. So uh, recognizing it as a leader, you have to first say, what am I not, not doing well? And so I feel like I end the week each week that I've done 60% of a lot of stuff and 0% of a lot, of, I, mean, I haven't done 100% of anything. So I've got to get better at that. I've got, therefore, if I'm feeling it, then probably me, my leadership team's feeling it. So we're going through that conversation now, is how do we make sure we're focused on the most important 
uh, activities. No different than if you're a student and you play a sport or in a sorority fraternity, you've got a part-time job, you got to stay focused. Okay, I've got a test coming up or, or a paper. That time management, that focus management is very important. Same thing with, you know, my plate just got bigger, but if I struggle that the little things took all my time and my energy, I let something big slide. So it's probably that, me being disciplined, not to chase the rabbit that some member threw at me. You ought to do this. No, that's not, doesn't fit my, my boss said do this. My boss is 35 board members. And um, I think it's no different than, than life. My daughter, she's in grad school, and she, when she calls frustrated, it's because she's I let her plate get a too big, and then a big issue's facing her. So learn how you can manage through those challenges, those demands. It ain't gonna get any easier. If you think, how many, how many of you think your life's really difficult now? Let me end on that one. <laughs> it's a cakewalk. I don't mean that disrespectful, because you don't have the perspective yet. You think because you got two finals coming up or you can't pay rent, been there. I'm telling you, it's, it's, it seems an unimaginable. Go talk to somebody, go get, they'll reach out to somebody. Just talking about it sometimes makes it better, but then there might be another solution you're not looking at. It'll happen whether you're running a company or running a classroom. Don't be shy to ask for help and, and get yourself somewhere, because all, we all have challenges. They're only gonna get more difficult. But um, you're in a good place now to use that. You can make some mistakes, don't worry about, you know, if you fail a test, big deal. Fail a class, that might be a big deal. But my point is, keep in perspective and do what you need to do. But it's been great to be with you all. Anytime I can be of assistance, the dean and, and John, anybody here knows how to get a hold of me. My cell phone's on my business card. Happy to help. We got a lot of business people who, we got a lot of leadership. I won't just say business leadership. We got a lot of people who are excited about you and are investing in you because we want you to make our lives easier. I mean, we can't just, you know, we're going to be retiring. 40 plus percent of our current workforce over the next six years. Retiring 40 percent. That means jobs for y'all if y'all are acclimated and, and, and academically qualified and you do experience. So we're counting on you. Keep doing what you're doing. I appreciate the chance to be with you. Let me have your attention for just one minute. John, I saw your hand up. Did you have something that you wanted to add? Not at the expense of a student. I was going to ask him to describe Columbus to one of the businesses you were um, trying to attract here for this group. We don't have time for that because I, I give them the full double barrel. <laughs> Columbus is an awesome place. And for, who's never been out of Columbus? I don't mean for a visit, but you've never lived anywhere but here. Okay. You're a worst folks to convince of that because you only have this perspective. Go travel, go somewhere else and go, wow, look at our downtown, look at our university. Keep, get that perspective that it could always be worse, but it may also not always be as good as you've been told. My daughter thinks Nashville's gonna just drop money in her lap. When she graduates, she's gonna be successful. I keep telling her every community's got warts, every community's got good things to be about. So we have a real easy time telling the Columbus story. Our toolbox is full. We got great people, we have great assets. It's a great place to live. And most people we've brought here that have never been here go, wow, I didn't realize Columbus had all this. So our job is to tell that more and for y'all to do the same thing. When y'all go off to visit Kennesaw or UGA or anywhere else, see your friends, tell them how great it here is. But we've got a great story to tell about Columbus. Now, I also want to recognize here uh, Mr. Rick Alexander. Mr. Rick, Rick, would you please stand up? He is the chairman of the advisory board for the Turner College of Business. He devotes a lot of time and a lot of his resources to helping us make this the best business school we can possibly make it. We also have Mr. Jason Cuevas, who is the regional vice president. Please stand up with Georgia Power, and he was one of our executive speakers last year. And it is just a tremendous sort of endorsement of, um, of us and what we do here, that they would take time out of their busy schedules to come and support Brian Anderson with his presentation this morning and to support the Turner College of Business. And so, if I can, Rick's past chair of our board, because he's been a, spent a year of his life helping this community, is chairing the chamber board, and Jason will do that next year. That is great. And so I just want to say, you are a part of an awesome community. Uh, the Turner College of Business would not be nearly the school that it is if it were not supported by the business community and the philanthropists in this community. And uh, you may not realize it now, but you have an awesome opportunity here. 
I've traveled the world going to business schools all over doing uh, reviews of business schools and I can tell you, you were just saying that if you haven't left here that you're not the best person to, to, to realize just how great things are here. The more business schools I go to, the more I realize what a great business school this is. But Amen. I want to say thank you to Mr. Anderson for being here today to take time out of your busy schedule. I know that this is just going to make your pile a little bit higher at the end of the week of the things that you didn't get to. So I realize that it's a sacrifice for you to be here today. But we have a little <laughs> token for him, a pen set, and we want him to reserve this pen set to use to ink some deals that are going to bring some more jobs to Columbus, Georgia that will be there when you graduate. Here, here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it.